Our call to worship this morning is by Susan McGinn. From beyond the playful summer clouds, beyond the earth's thin blue line, from beyond the bright moon and meteor showers, we hear the call to look and listen carefully to turn away from a world that buys and sells happiness, to fully experience the luring whisper of your heart's truth. Why not today? Why not now? We are here and together at home in this evolving place, home in this ever-changing breath and body, home in this dewy morning, even as it reaches toward a hot, high, noon. We hear the call from far beyond and deep within, and we do not hear it alone. May McGinn's words guide us now into this sacred time and space. Come, let us worship together. Each Sunday, we begin our time of worship together with a ritual that, is, that happens in Unitarian and Universalist congregations all over the country. We light the flaming chalice, the symbol of our faith, and thereby set aside this time for worship. I invite you now to join me in our chalice lighting response, which is printed in your order of service. O flame of our faith, open our hearts and fill our bodies and souls with persistent strength, enliven our spirits, and engage us deeply in this life of ours, this sacred, essential moment now. I invite you now to rise with me and join in singing hymn number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
So Sarah, Sarah Whitney, everybody. <laughs> I just, I want to tell you that I've been around long enough now that I remember when you were a young violinist, mm -hmm. quite a young violinist. Um, and I just wanted to ask you first, what drew you to the violin? Oh, what drew me to the violin? Well, the story goes, well, first of all, both my parents played the violin uh, when I was growing up. Um, in community orchestras and things, so I was surrounded by music from a very young age. But the story goes that I have, a, I have an older brother, it's not a story, that's, a, that's real. Um, <laughs> I have an older brother and um, he played the violin and I, when I was four years old, I apparently I begged and begged to get my own because I wanted to be cool like my older brother. Is that right, mom? <laughs> yeah. So that is what I remember. Uh, well, I don't know if I remember that, but that's the story. So I really wanted to be like Eric. Um, I'm now the professional violinist, and he is an IT consultant. There you go. <laughs> but it was cool. But you were cool. But I was very cool. And so, so you loved it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But you must have had to work pretty hard. Yes, definitely. So you loved it. What did mm -hmm. you love about it? What did I love about it? I guess I can probably speak more about what I love about it now than when I was, well, actually, I can speak to both of those things. I think as a young child, I started when I was four, um, the program that I started violin in was called this, a Suzuki program. Suzuki is a very widely met a known method for teaching young musicians music. And there's Suzuki violin, Suzuki cello, Suzuki piano, a lot of things. And that involved one-on-one -on -one private lessons, but also group lessons. So I got to be in a group with other young musicians playing violin, and I think that was really fun. The community aspect of it was something that I always really loved. And now, um, I think about connection, uh, being a musician, and being able to connect with people, um, no matter what your language is, no matter the demographic, what anything. It's a way for us to connect universally, and um, I really have bring, it brings me a lot of joy to create unique experiences for audiences. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so you, have, you have a career, a really wonderful multidimensional career as a musical entrepreneur, as a teacher, um, and as you're doing something really unusual, I think, in the classical music world, mm -hmm. which is that you have this, this partner should I say a partner? Yeah, in, yeah that. Yeah. And if you want to say a little bit about how you found the looping pedal, the loop sure. pedal, sure. and what it, what what drew you to it? Sure. Well, yeah. For those of you who aren't familiar or can't see my feet, um, I have some pedals at my feet, and that's how I'm able to turn myself essentially into a band or an orchestra. Um, and the loop pedal um, really is something I discovered. Um, I would say maybe about 10 years ago. And actually, the next piece I'm going to play is um, by Jessica Meyer. She's a violist in New York City, and she's actually the reason I started playing with the loop pedal. Now, Jessica is an incredible violist. She plays a lot of stuff for viola and loop pedal. She's also a composer. And I heard her play, actually, this piece I'm going to play for you. And I heard her do it, and I just said, what is that thing? What? It's amazing. And I just was completely enamored with the ability to do what the loop pedal can do and just expand what is traditionally thought of as a solo violin. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about it, is that it really pushes the boundaries. It does a lot of things that you wouldn't expect and really changes what it means to be a solo player. So that was how it started. And um, yeah, and this is the next piece I'm going to play, actually, is the very first piece for violin and loop pedal I ever played. I told Jessica, I said, hey, I want to play that piece. Can you please send me an arrangement for violin and loop pedal? And she said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I've noticed that what you do is that on the loop pedal that you, you, you set layers of music and then, and then at some point you go off and you can do something called improvisation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, it feels like you're just playing. <laughs> and it looks like you're playing. So you <laughs> dance even. I, you'll just notice. Is that what it's like? I do dance a little when I play. It's not, it's just, it's totally natural. I can't not dance. Um, yeah, so there's many ways I use the loop pedal, and throughout today you'll see them. One of the ways is how Beth mentioned, where I can create layers 
and then I can stop myself, stop the recording and just play and just improvise and make anything up I want over top the layers that I have created. And one thing about improvisation that I think is, is wonderful, well, there's two aspects of it that are really fun. Of course, it is making something up, but it's more than that. It's more than just making something up on the spot. And I believe that in addition to making things up, I'm also drawing from everything I know and everything I've heard. So I'm taking little snippets of things that I've heard someone else do and I'm putting them together in my order. Or I'm, doing, I'm making something up and then putting it together with something that maybe I played, I don't know, last week. And this could be a matter of three notes. It could be a whole measure. It could be a phrase. Um, so it's a combination of incorporating everything that I have ever heard as a musician um, into something brand new and unique that will never be replicated exactly ever again. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm guessing that there are people in this room now who are looking at your loop pedal and saying, I'd like to try that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, thank you so much. And we're so looking forward to, to hearing more of, of, your, of your interaction with your loop pedal. Thanks, Sarah. Well, it's great to have you here today. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. And we can talk about a loop pedal okay. lesson. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us your story. And it, for us, it's so special to have someone who grew up here come back and share your gifts with us. I know you do that many times with concerts and things, but thank you for being a part of the service. Today, we are going to celebrate Mother's Day. So if there are children here who would like to come and we're gonna make some floral crowns, we're gonna bake cookies, um, and children and teens are welcome if you'd like to join us. Um, looking forward to celebrating together outdoors after the service. Thank you. Please join together in song. Our reading this morning is an excerpt from Bossy Pants by Tina Fey. She wrote, the first rule of improvisation is agree. Always agree and say yes. When you're improvising, this means you are required to agree with whatever your partner has created. So if we're improvising and I say freeze, I have a gun, and you say, that's not a gun, it's your finger. You're pointing your finger at me. Our improvised scene has ground to a halt. But if I say, freeze, I have a gun, and you say, the gun I gave you for Christmas, then we have started a scene because we have agreed that my finger is in fact a Christmas gun. Now obviously in real life, you're not always going to agree with everything everyone says. But the rule of agreement reminds you to respect what your partner has created and to at least start from an open-minded place. Start with a yes and see where that takes you. As an improviser, I always find it jarring when I meet someone in real life whose first answer is no. No, we can't do that. No, that's not in the budget. No, I will not hold your hand for a dollar. What kind of way is that to live? The second rule of improvisation is not only to say yes, but yes and. You are supposed to agree and then add something of your own. If I start a scene with, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you just say, yeah, we're kind of at a standstill. But if I say, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you say, what did you expect? We're in hell. Or if I say, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you say, yes, this can't be good for the wax figures. Or if I say, I can't believe it's so hot in here, and you say, I told you we shouldn't have crawled into this dog's mouth. Now we're getting somewhere. To me, yes and 
means don't be afraid to contribute. It's your responsibility to contribute. Always make sure you're adding something to the discussion. Your initiations are worthwhile.
playing football, playing basketball, playing baseball, playing hockey, playing soccer, lacrosse, volleyball, tennis, golf, playing chess, backgammon, checkers, monopoly, or scrabble, playing bridge, euchre, heart, spades, rummy, go fish, uno, poker, or blackjack. And this doesn't even begin to include the electronic options now available to us, from Mario Kart to Fortnite. As adults, there are so many sports or games we play, and personally, I'm a big fan of many of them. I love games. The problem is, somewhere along the line, the idea of competitive play has started to dominate our understanding of and how we play. All of these activities either have goals to achieve, end with winners and losers, or both. Why has adult play evolved to be so competitive? Because for kids, especially young children, the point of play is not to win. The point is to have fun. For our littlest ones, there is no winning at the playground. Parents don't set their children loose and say, don't come back until you've managed to swing back and forth a hundred times in a row. There's no, that's right, you won, you beat the slide. We don't hear, explore that fort faster. I want you to have checked out every nook and cranny within 15 minutes or you will have failed. Right? We don't do that. The point of playing on the playground is about the process. It's about having fun. It's about the experience. It's about enjoying the rush of the wind on your face as you're swinging back and forth. It's about the whoosh of going down the slide. It's about exploring every nook and cranny of the play structure, find all the different ways to climb it, all the hidden places, and then going and doing it again just because, and then going back a third time to turn one section into a fort, and then a fourth time to make it into a pirate ship. We got a Nintendo Switch for our Christmas for our family, and one of the games we play is, illustrates this different approach to me so clearly. One of the games that we've, we've really started to enjoy is called Animal Crossing. Some of you may have played it. And the basic gameplay is that you live on an island, your character does, and you gather resources so that you can build things. The more you play, the more cool things you can unlock to build. And the more things you unlock to build, the more resources you have to gather to be able to build them. So in our family, the parent and child approach to gameplay couldn't be more different. When Elizabeth and I play, it's with the goals in mind. What do I need to do to unlock the next thing? How can I get the most resources? And so for me, I'm very much about process and efficiency, and so I've got strategies, right, to get the most resources the quickly so I can move forward in the game. Our kids, though, couldn't care less about gathering resources. Our boys have no interest in doing that, and as soon as they get their turn, they open up the designer function in the game so they can start drawing pictures to put on flags, t-shirts, and accessories for their characters. And so it's just it's so interesting to me, right? On days where we have a schedule of playing time, we have six people in our family, so we have to schedule it. Um, but I would run around trying to fit all my stuff into half an hour, almost anxious, right? Because this is supposed to be the fun thing I'm doing. But I'm almost anxious trying to get it all in, get it all done. And then I'd watch the boys open up the app and spend their entire half hour making pictures. I don't think you could engage more differently with the game than we do. I try to achieve goals, they choose to be creative. Now, I know that there are adult games that are about embracing creativity, and certainly there are video games that do that as well. Minecraft is a great example. What I want to lift up, though, is this thing we adults tend to do, where we focus on the goal or on winning or games that involve strategy. And there is certainly fun to be had in that. I love strategy games. And what is lost when we don't play in a way that is just to have fun? What is lost when we mostly or only play games that involve thinking and few or no games that involve our creativity and imagination? Professor of Theology Brendan McInerney writes that, quote, we are most fully human when we engage in those acts that are ends in themselves. In other words, he is pro-play, for the purpose of play is the playing itself. We use a rake for, pur for the purpose of achieving a specific end, right? We're cleaning up the leaves, raking. As McInerney notes, imagine a toddler, run toddler running around her home growling and roaring like a lion. 
to ask what the child's purpose is as she runs around roaring like a lion is almost absurd. Her purpose is precisely to run around roaring like a lion. Her means are identical to her ends. McInerney continues, Considering play for human existence helps us to realize what makes our lives most meaningful. The temptation exists to reduce ourselves in the world to instruments, tools to fulfill some task. But, of course, he continues, we hope we retain the knowledge that what matters most in our lives does not fit this at all. Our loved ones, precisely by being loved, are never just instruments for us and all those activities we do out of love are not simply some means to some other end. They carry a weight that purpose doesn't measure. McInerney goes on to suggest that much of what we do in religious community mirrors play in this way. He says that the point of theology, the point of ritual, the point of music that we sing together or listen to on Sunday mornings often isn't to accomplish anything. The point is to be here in the moment, experiencing what we're doing together. Writer and theologian Henry Nelson Wyman, who became Unitarian Universalist later in life, identified the, quote, the creative source of human good as an empirically observable process within the natural world of events and relations. Events and relations. Wyman claimed that God is the creative process, the creative event, that tendency in the world wherein the several parts of life are connected in mutual support, vivifying and enhancing one another in the creation of a more inclusive unity of events and possibilities. In short, he concludes, God is creative transformation, the growth of meaning and value in the world. One doesn't need to be a theist to draw connections between play, creativity, and the sacred. Creativity is all over nature. There is constant change. There is new forms of life coming into being. There are flowers that just come up just because. And play is there too especially in the animal kingdom, right? Uh, cats, laser pointers, almost anything, really. Boxes, they like it all. Dogs chasing a stick, monkeys playing. I mean, animals play. There's a purpose in it that is its own purpose, not to achieve a goal. Just as play, creativity, and imagination are part of the natural world, so too are they part of us, and we need them. We need that doing for the sake of doing, that finding joy and fun and creativity and imagination. It feeds our spirits. It helps lift us up when times are hard. Now, I'm not telling you to try to go play like a little kid, though I certainly wouldn't discourage it either. But there's things we can learn from adults who make their money by playing for a living. And I'm not talking about professional sports. As we heard from Tina Fey in our reading this morning, one of the main rules of comedic improvis improvisation is to say yes to everything. As Fey outlined for us, when you say no in improv, you take all the air out of a scene. My finger's a gun, no it's not, takes all the air out. It's the gun I got you for Christmas gives the scene direction and energy. There's an attitude in this approach. It's a stance, right? It's not just something, as we heard Tina say, it's not just something that she does when she's doing improv. It's an approach, it's an, uh, an attitude towards life of underlying improvisation that many of us would do well to bring more of to our lives. How often do you say no? And are there times where maybe you can more say yes? As but one example, what is your response when it rains? When it rains, do you always grab an umbrella or stay indoors? Or do you rush inside and change into dry clothes if you get caught? Or do you wait it out in your car? Or rush from your car to indoors lamenting how everything is getting wet? Do you ever choose instead to go outside to get soaked on purpose and relish the nourishing water that gives life to everything on our planet. 
This approach to openness to what is and making the best of it was perfectly illustrated for me just a couple of years ago on the beach. Our family was having a day at the beach. We're sitting in a nice comfy chair. And I saw a couple of men walk by our family down that direction. They had come quite a distance. They were walking. And about 20 minutes later, they were headed back in the other direction whence they came. And one of them was rolling a tire. And it really jumped out at me because I know what my reaction would almost certainly have been if I had found a tire on the beach. First, I would have groaned internally, saying something to myself or maybe out loud about, ugh, it's awful what we do to the environment. Whether this was dumped in the ocean or left behind by someone who came to visit, why don't people seem to care anymore? And that probably would have been it, if I'm being honest. I'd like to think differently, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't actually occur to me to take the tire away because that's a lot of work, especially when you've got kids with you. And then if I had gotten it home, right, then I have to dispose of it, all this stuff, right? I would have complained and left it is most likely what would have happened. But it brought a smile to my face to see this guy because he didn't, he hadn't just grabbed the tire, he was playing with it. He was rolling it, running, running with it to see how far he could get it to go before it fell over. Then he would roll it in a circle sometimes, looking at the patterns he was making in the sand. He would jump over it and then back, laughing and smiling and having a good time. He was taking the tire off the beach, but more importantly, he was doing it by playing and having fun, and he was so joyful. Never mind the good deed he was doing. He was having fun, pure and simple. And so this is my invitation to each and every one of us to invite, to bring in, to choose more playfulness in our lives, to find opportunities to play just for the sake of playing. Not everything can be made into a game, of course, but if you pay attention to toddlers and little ones, you'll notice how much can be. That tire-rolling man on the beach could have decided it was too much work to do, make, to do something better for the environment. He could have chosen to take the tire and complain about it the whole time, but he didn't. He chose to make a game out of it. He chose to take what some might view as a chore, and he made it fun. If disposing of a discarded tire on our beach can be made into a game, there's a heck of a lot of other stuff that we treat as difficult work that can be too. Now, living through the pandemic has been tough. And things are really starting to feel like they're getting back to a new normal, which is great. As we move into this new way of living in the world brought on by the pandemic, I encourage us, I encourage you, to consider choosing play as a spiritual practice. Maybe you set aside some time in your schedule for playing for the sake of playing, which would be great, but you don't even need to go that far. You can also, like our tire-rolling friend, choose to play in the moment with whatever is going on at hand. More deeply, whether you choose to actively play or not, I invite you to consider the yes and approach to life. What can you joyfully say yes to, inviting in that sense of openness and wonder? Where can you add to the goodness that is already on hand? My good friends, however it looks to you, I invite you to find some place in the next week to bring an extra serving of playfulness, creativity, and imagination to your life. It will enrich your own soul and enrich the lives of those around you. Amen.